I'm Sarah Mock and welcome to Crusonia Conversations, a forum bringing together entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts in ag, food, and health, a group passionate about the fundamental belief that food is health. Thanks, Sarah. I'm Carter Williams, CEO of iSelect. We focus on hard problems. One of those hard problems is Americans spend 1.6 trillion every year on food, but spend nearly 2 trillion on diet-related illnesses like type 2 diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. Each of these is fatal in their own rights. They're more fatal when they're comorbidities for COVID-19. These are tough problems. You know, at iSelect, we believe if you want any hard problem solved, you give it to an entrepreneur. We believe that you cannot solve the healthcare challenge we face without the evolution to a new, better, and more nutritious food system. Our work at iSelect and the broader work we're doing with Crisonia is focused on bringing the right people together to make this happen, to affect the change, to bring entrepreneurs forward, large corporations, healthcare systems, and patients together to make real progress to solve the problem associated with healthcare, to introduce better food, to make it so that food and health are combined as a solution to improve our quality of life. Our hope is that results are measured not only through the traditional financial metrics, but through a fundamental and positive impact on reversing the footprint and impact of diet-related illness. Today, we're talking about the intersection of sugar and health. Sugar has been linked to type 2 diabetes, heart disease, even cancer. And in the midst of a global pandemic, its effect on immunology and potential to increase susceptibility to COVID-19 make this a critical time to talk about structural and systemic challenges and potential opportunities of America's sugar addiction. Here to help us dig into those links between food and health and the opportunities for investing in the future of health, food, and agriculture, we're joined today by Carter Williams and Dr. Robert Lustig. Dr. Lustig is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco. He specializes in neuroendocrinology, and his research and clinical practice has focused on childhood obesity and diabetes. He has fostered a global discussion of metabolic health and nutrition, exposing some of the leading myths that underlie the current pandemic of diet-related disease. Ann Carter-Williams, CEO of iSelect Fund and founder of Crusonia.org. iSelect is investment with impact, a firm that believes deeply that investment at the nexus of food and health will both contribute to social good and create significant financial growth opportunities. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us today. Let's dive right in. Dr. Lustig, I want to ask you kind of right off the top, is sugar toxic? The answer is sugar indeed is toxic. There are three things that sugar, and in particular the molecule fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, do that other nutrients that we consume don't. The first is it generates fat in the liver. And that liver fat causes liver dysfunction, insulin resistance, and insulin resistance is the hallmark and the driver of all of these chronic metabolic diseases. The second thing that fructose does that other molecules don't is it causes the aging reaction. And fructose, that sweet molecule, drives that reaction seven times faster than glucose. And then the third thing that fructose does that the other nutrients don't is it activates the reward system. And by doing so, it causes us to consume even more, which of course is why the food industry uses it as its primary go-to because when they, they learned back in the 1980s, when they added it, we bought more. I'm curious whether or how much you both think that the U.S.'s agricultural policies are, are currently having a, a direct influence on diets. Are the way we, we subsidize kind of grain production, specifically corn production, is that, do you think, directly contributing to the public health crisis? Yeah, I think it, it creates a rigidity in the system. So that means us as investors, we, we want to look at other ways to produce good ingredients in the system. They may not be perfect but they might have a lower glycemic index and we and they might have enough of a profit appeal 
that we can start to move those systems along. And if farmers then say, well, that's a reasonable thing and they start shifting, that's gonna be part of the mix. Uh, but we really see it as sort of a, the sort of refinery system problem in our, in our role is what are the innovations we can stick in there that, that are profitable so that people want to adopt it? So I, I would argue uh, that what we should be talking not about is a refinery model, but is the subsidy model. Uh, that I think there are actually two separate models that have contributed to this, and they both have to be undone. The first has to do with subsidies <clears throat> to, for commodity crops. <clears throat> the subsidies were put in place back at the end of World War II, and we upped our ante because we doubled down because we realized we could make money at this. You know, the subsidy is a tax, okay? It's a subsidy on the thing you're subsidizing. It's a tax on everything else because you have to make book. So, you know, it is distorting the market. And the problem is we have distorted the market to uh, facilitate commodity crops, i.e. processed food, which is now killing us. So that's the first, is get rid of the subsidies. So the question is, would the price of food change if we got rid of all food subsidies? I mean, there's no economist on the planet that believes in food subsidies because they distort the market. And I agree with that. I mean, even libertarians can get on board with that notion. Uh, turns out the Giannini Foundation at UC Berkeley did this modeling exercise several years ago and found that the price of food would not change except two items, corn and sugar. And those are the things we actually do want to go up because we need to consume less of them. The second model is also now being changed, and that was the casino model of the insurance industry. Because they did pay to play, set the rates, just like you do at a casino. They were happy when you got sick, just the same way a casino is happy when you walk in the door. But Obamacare, and you can think whatever you want about Obamacare, it did one thing that was effective. It capped insurance profit at 15%. Now the insurance company can't make money on you being sick. Now they actually want you to be healthy so they can keep the difference. The problem is they don't know how. So if you undid both the subsidy model on the food side and the casino model on the medical and insurance side, then you could actually have a level playing field and we could actually change the food and change health in America. In the 70s, we saw this phenomenon of everyone realizing that fat is bad and, and we took a lot of fat out of foods and we replaced it with other things. That turned out to be an incorrect way to, to solve that problem. Um, when we're looking at some of these new possible innovations in this space, are, we, are you guys worried at all that in 20 years we're going to be having the same conversation about protein or about any of these other ingredients that we're trying to, to use as replacements for sugar? Uh, we think about it as investors. Uh, I think that we discover things down the road that we didn't know at the time or that were difficult to understand at the time. There's sort of two factors. One, chemically, biologically, is the thing we're developing uh, have a negative profile. Two, because of where it fits into the system, is it going to accelerate in its adoption? When we go to, when we talk to other countries, they basically see the Western diet coming at them 100,000 miles an hour. Their consumers are doing better. They're moving into the middle class. They want to shift their food system a bit. And they're more and more adopting the Western diet. And, and it's hitting them a lot faster than it hit us. And so when we talk to policymakers in, those, in India and places like that, they're worried both, one, how do we serve up the Western diet? Two, how are we going to deal with the cost of associated health care? Because we, in our system, we don't, we don't have that right now. We have a, where our health care system doesn't have that burden. Um, the net effect of all of that is uh, there's going to be a lot of innovation that comes down. Whenever you're in a market where our technology is accelerating and consumer demand is pressuring it and the economic pressure is more intense, is a, a perfect time to really look outside to startups and things like that for, for better answers. Well, I completely agree, Carter, but you know, the fact of the matter is people have tried, at least thus far, recognizing what the problem is. And since we're talking about developing countries, let's talk about the story of India. Indra Nooyi, CEO of Pepsi, introduced the good for you line. 
They always had the fun for you line, the Pepsi and the Doritos, and they had the better for you line, like the Slim Jims. And then now they had the good for you line, like the chia seeds and the hummus and the pretzels and all that. And in 2011, PepsiCo lost $349 million and Wall Street called for Indra Nui's head on a silver platter because she, quote, took her eye off the ball. She survived that, but you have not heard or seen anything re relevant to the good for you line ever since. Yeah. In 2014, the Financial Times reported that the government of India went back to Pepsi and said, you have to reformulate Pepsi-Cola to stop the diabetes epidemic in India. So here's a government prevailing upon a conglomerate to do something very specific to try to improve health care, and they couldn't, and they didn't. Yeah, and that's where I think we're going to see this incredible pressure, certainly in the CPG side, um, that they have a real they have a real challenge, and Pepsi's a good one. I mean, in, of the CPGs, there, there's a list of people way behind Pepsi in this entire conversation. I did not know that story, but that, that just shows that their the rigidities in their business yeah. are going to make it extraordinarily difficult for them to, to figure it out, which is, well, I, we believe in entrepreneurs and why, you know, we might see something come out of that realm that, that, that then get acquired by people like Pepsi or open up new markets uh, as people figure out what's going on on the ground and what's the best answer. It's hard to turn an aircraft carrier around, especially when it's powered by sugar. Yeah. <laughs> With what we know about the problem, I wonder if you can both kind of give from your perspective, what, what are some possible ways forward? I would argue that um, the paradigm actually already exists. It's worked once and it could work again. The paradigm is called differential subsidization. Let me show you how it worked. 1977, three countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, huge alcohol problem. And they were losing money on both sides of the ledger. They were losing money on the positive side of the ledger because of decreased productivity, because of employees calling in on their vendors. And they were losing money on the negative side of the ledger because of cirrhosis of the liver and car accidents. These three countries banded together in 1977 and passed two pieces of legislation that were yoked together. The first was they nationalized the liquor stores so that every liquor store sold the same fare at the same price. So you couldn't go someplace else and buy it cheaper. The second thing they did was they taxed high alcohol spirits and they used the money collected from that tax to subsidize low alcohol beer. And over the course of the next 20 years, all three countries witnessed a reduction in cirrhosis of the liver, car accidents, which then plateaued at 20 years, and an increase in productivity that matched it. And th those two pieces of legislation are still in force today in all three countries because it worked. It was the carrot and the stick. It wasn't the carrot, it wasn't the stick, it was the carrot and the stick, differential subsidization. So how could that work today? Let me give you an example. Let's talk about soda. The beverage industry makes the soda. They also make the water. Why don't we tax the soda and use the money from the tax to subsidize bottled water? They make both. Why do they care which they sell? You gotta drink. Nobody doesn't drink. So they could make money selling the right thing and make everyone healthier in the process and let them market their waters up the wazoo. I don't care. The point is everyone would be healthier for it. The, food, the beverage industry would still make money and the uh, populace would still have their choice, but they'd have less availability of exposure and everyone would get healthier. Differential subsidization. I want to hear your vision for a world that has a more limited sugar intake than, than what we have right now. What do the technologies look like? What do the regulations look like? What does public health look like? Well, the first thing is we've got to find another use for sugar. 
because we got a lot of it growing. Uh, in terms of the food, I think that ultimately these various technologies that uh, Carter has been talking about, figuring out exactly how to mix protein with fat in order to be, shall we say, palatable, tasty, and not generate uh, a, a, an adverse metabolic response. The problem is that the FDA, because these things are, quote, food, because they're found in food, they don't de ask for the um, chronic toxicity experiments. There's a difference between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is what your body does to a drug Pharmacodynamics is what a drug does to your body. The FDA asks for the former, not for the latter, because it's not in their charter, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act of 1938. Ultimately, we need both. And the food industry doesn't want to do them because it can only hurt their chances of getting something on the market. It can only hurt their profits. Well, we're going to see on, the, on sort of the healthcare side is with new technology, people were, are going to manage their health in a more effective way. Uh, we're going to see a lot of the healthcare delivery models shift. Uh, some of that's accelerated by COVID. And we're going to see a bulk of the next generation of entrepreneurs uh, figure out how to eliminate waste, how to improve nutritional taste, and make those kinds of innovations. And uh, it, it's utterly, totally clear. I can see those companies starting to assemble. But it's going to be a 30-year thing. It's not going to be a 10-year thing. You don't make these kinds of changes. It took us 40, 50, 60 years to get here. You mentioned earlier that a good, a, a, an improved food system, a better food system is good business. I wonder if you can explain that a little because I think one of um, Dr. Lustig's points here is the problem is bad food sells really well. So where, for who is a better food system good business for if, if this food system has been good business for the current food players. Well, so that's a, where's, where's the power? Is the power on the consumer or is it on the supplier? Right now, the supply chain is so tuned up to deliver corn soy at a discount that it's very easy for the CPGs to sort of control the market because they've got huge price advantage through that entire network. So I would argue that there's a stakeholder that has been left out of the discussion. And that is the insurer. The insurance company has a lot of power and a lot of play in this. Ultimately, the insurance companies now want people to be healthy. As I said, you know, the, the rules changed on them and they don't know how. The question is, is food medicine? And the answer is good food is medicine, bad food is poison. <laughs> okay, it's that simple. It's not that bad food is neutral, it's that bad food is poison, but good food is medicine. There are eight subcellular pathologies. Every single one of those is underpinning and driving chronic metabolic disease around the world. None of them are diseases themselves. There's no ICD-11 code for any of those, but every one of those is foodable, not druggable. There is no pill for this. And the insurance industry hasn't yet figured that out. When they do, the insurer is going to realize, you know what? We are the thousand pound gorilla that can take on the food industry. We're the only ones who can take on the food industry because we're as big as the food industry. And they are working at cross purposes to us because when they win, we lose. And when, so when we ultimately get them on board and to take on the food industry, that's when things will change and not one minute before. I, I honestly believe when you take anybody at the bottom of the pyramid, they are not getting proper health care in this country. And it's because they're eating the wrong stuff. So we could either stick them into the expensive health care system, or we could get it so that they have a better way to get food and their lives are going to be improved as a result of that. And there's more than enough market opportunity serving those people more effectively. And it's an unmet need right now where they do want it, but they can't access it. Just think about what's happened to the price of insulin. It's gone up a thousand percent. There are people who need insulin who will die without insulin and they can't even access it because of the price now. The point is that pharma has to come along. And right now they're not alone because they're making a fortune doing what they do. Is there enough opportunity in improving health for healthcare providers and insurance companies that if they make the investment in food, they will 
net a profit out of the, the positive effects that come through healthier patients. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Excellent. Absolutely. Now that we've had a chance to hear from Dr. Lustig and Carter Williams, hear them answer my questions, we're now turning to you, the audience. Uh, a few notes kind of about how this Q&A session will work. If you have a question for either one of our speakers, please write your question into the Q&A, uh, which can be found at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom app. Our moderator will put you in the queue and uh, when you're up, I'll recognize you by name and your camera and microphone will be unmuted. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Maria Costanza, who has the first question for uh, our panelists here today. Maria? Uh, looks like we're having a little bit of a connection issue there, but uh, Maria's question for Carter and Dr. Lustig is, what are the top sweeteners that you see in the future? Um, maybe Ilan Samish or Amai proteins. Do you see a world with less sweeteners or just an exchange of sweeteners? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, I hope that we can have less sweeteners. You know, sugar should be safe and rare. And uh, the sweeteners basically make it ubiquitous. The question is, do sweeteners have toxicity? And the answer is, the empiric data is now coming in, and the short answer is, the toxicity of one Coke equals the toxicity of two Diet Cokes. So you'd say to me, how can that be? Diet Cokes have no sugar. They have no calories. There should be no toxicity. That's not true. The diet sweeteners, by telling the brain that sugar is coming, even though sugar is not, causes a release of insulin, and that insulin still drives weight gain and still drives chronic metabolic disease. Second, we know that certain diet sweeteners, not all, but certain diet sweeteners seem to alter the intestinal microbiome, setting you up for leaky gut and therefore chronic inflammation and driving chronic metabolic disease as well. And there's even some early data that suggests that some adipose tissue, some fat tissue have uh, receptors for sweeteners on them. So the bottom line is even though sweeteners are missing fructose, which drives liver fat. And even though sweeteners are missing calories, they still don't uh, do you a service. I would like to see us try to, you know, steer toward real food. And certainly diet sweeteners are not any of those. Are there any diet sweeteners that are better than others? That's a tough question. Right now, Stevia seems to have the best pharmacokinetic profile, but we need a pharmacodynamic profile in order to answer that question. And there are none because the food industry won't do it. This is a challenge whenever we're developing new technology, you know, to some degree entrepreneurs are trying to build a better product at a lower cost. And as we think about the food system and ingredients generally, uh, the question, a little bit of our question is, is we're trying to improve quality of food, make it reachable by everybody and then there's a cost factor, and then there's a fact that certain people's behavior won't change. And so one view that we've had is if we look at some of the alternate sugars, which we've been investing in, what will they improve overall health uh, as a relative measure? And then we can keep working ourselves to more effective systems overall. It, it is a very tough problem in terms of both bringing new innovation to market making sure that new innovation doesn't cause some harm at the same time and sort of looking at the overall impact. And so that's why we work with people like Dr. Lustig to, to try to balance that out and try to understand what's the most immediately um, effective solution to try to move people along. Thanks for that answer. Uh, just a little confusion there. Apologies to Elon Samish uh, from My Proteins. That was your question, not Maria's. Maria, we're going to come back to your question in just a moment, but we want to first uh, have Ed Rogers go ahead and ask your question live. Your mic is ready. Uh, sure. Dr. Dr. Lustig, I was curious if you're familiar with the rare sugars, uh, tagatose and allulose, uh, if you have an opinion about those. And if you're not familiar with them, I'd be happy to talk about the, um, the physical and uh, health benefits of them. 
Right. I, I am familiar with them. And what I can say is we don't have the data yet. Uh, you know, we have the sweetness data. We have the early pharmacokinetic data. But like I said, we don't have pharmacodynamic data. We don't know what the brain does yet. We don't know what the adipose tissue does yet to these uh, sweeteners. Um, they are possibles. I'm not going to you know, discount them. Uh, you know, I'm the science guy, you know, show me the science and we don't have it yet. Uh, yes, they exist. Yes, they're being developed. Uh, yes, they are on fast track with uh, various companies. Yes, they've been um, uh, 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 given sanction by the uh, FDA as uh, generally recognized as safe. That doesn't mean they are. There are many things that are generally recognized as safe that aren't. Uh, there are 10,000 items on the grass list. You think you can actually eat 10,000 items and it won't kill you? Um, you know, the bottom line is uh, we don't have the data to support their uh, uh, ubiquitous uh, and global use. May I ask a follow-up? Sure. So I, I'm not sure I agree about we don't have the data. Tagatose has been around for at least 20 years. We've got an extensive bibliography that discusses the health benefits of Tagatose. It's probably got close to 100 footnotes, different uh, research papers. Um, the, the data shows that it reduces postprandial and fasting blood glucose levels, postprandial and fasting insulin levels, reduces HbA1c levels, reduces total cholesterol and increases HDL, good for the gut, uh, good for weight control, does not trigger the brain to overeat, actually increases the sense of satiety and therefore helps lead to uh, weight control, also safe for teeth. And our company can make it from either commodity starch or from byproduct, byproduct starch from other um, food processes at a cost that will um, challenge high fructose corn syrup costs. Well, I would be very happy to see all the data. If you want to send me you know, your portfolio, I can take a look and see whether or not you know, it, it, uh, it it actually says what you say it does. Lo love um, to love to chat, love to follow up with you afterwards. Absolutely. So, Doctor Lustig, one one you know when we do a drug, we go through trial process. But as I think about it, as we're looking at new foods, there's no you know trials are done because they're sort of mandated. But what what's the right architecture to as we're thinking about new foods and we're talking about food as health? Is there what's the right architecture to do that study? Is that, is that independent researchers doing that study? They're, they're not really going after an FDA thing, but is there, is there some other structure that we should be thinking about for doing well, that? So th that is a very, very pointed and important question, Carter. How does nutrition research get done in this country and by whom and for whom? Uh, as you probably know, there is no National Institute of Nutrition at the NIH. It has been proposed, but you know, it languishes. I think that that would be the best place to start, is to actually have a central clearinghouse of nutritional information that can be believed. Because right now, the food industry is in charge of nutrition research in this country. And what we've learned, and I can point to the papers and the data, what we've learned is that when a food industry concern does its own research, it is 7.36 times more likely to come up with a result that's beneficial to that industry. Yeah. That would suggest highly that the uh, industry-sponsored research is biased. We need an independent clearinghouse for nutritional information in order to be able to manage this properly. So thinking through those incentives, would it be, do you think the health insurance companies might be willing to help underwrite part of that? Or is there a conflict there? I don't know that there's a conflict there per se. Uh, ultimately, what I'd like to see is that the NIH, you know, basically get, get the money and that it, uh, it, it's done, you know, through taxpayer dollars. And yeah. There's no uh, inherent conflict of interest. That would be the best way. Yeah. And unfortunately, you also have to make sure that the scientists who are in charge of that institute are not on the take. Uh, so many yeah, it's just the we are, food, food system are. Yeah. yeah, important points there. I want to uh, bring some of our answer or our questioners back in. Uh, Maria Costanza, would you like to an uh, ask your question right now? <laughs> oh, 
Well, I have her for sure. Maria's question this time is uh, on food labels. Why do they have separate lines for carbohydrates and sugar? She says, as a Lustig disciple, uh, she knows that they are the same. Well, they are not the same. So total carbohydrate means any mono, di, or polysaccharide. That's what total carbohydrate means. And it can be from any source. Sugar, the specific line for sugar, is specifically fructose containing compounds. That is sucrose or high fructose corn syrup, maple syrup, agave, or honey. That's what dietary sugar means. The problem with that uh, uh, label though, is it doesn't tell you whether the sugar that you're measuring was inherent in the food itself, like the fruit or a vegetable, or whether it's been added by the industry specifically for its purposes. So it's been proposed, it was proposed back in 2016 by the Obama administration that it should say added sugars on the label, not total sugars. An example of that, raisin bran. Raisins have eight grams of sugar per serving. Raisin bran, Kellogg's or Post, have 16 grams of sugar per serving. Where the other eight grams come from? Well, if you ever look at a raisin in a raisin in box of raisin bread, it ain't purple. It's white. They are all dipped in powdered sugar on purpose to make them sweeter so you will buy them. So total sugars don't tell you what the food industry did to the food. Added sugars at least does. The problem is the Trump administration delayed that ruling. And right now it is not across the board. However, some companies have gone ahead and switched to added sugars anyway, because they see the bus coming down the road. Thanks for that answer, Dr. Lustig. We're gonna go now to Tanya Stewart. Tanya, would you like to ask your question? Well, uh, we will go ahead and <laughs> ask it. Oh. Are you there? Can you hear me okay? Sorry, yes, I didn't see the alert. Um, so thank you so much. Question is back to the health plan and really going into detail a bit on the architecture. What do you believe, um, either Dr. Lustig or Carter, um, what do you believe the health plan should cover as far as cost of food? So if you divide it up into two categories, one, people who have chronic diseases like diabetes or asthma or other, versus those who do not, but are at risk for developing, so prevention. Carter, you want to start? I've got to... I know you go first on this one. We've talked about it a lot, and I'm, I'm still unsettled on what to do, but go ahead. You go first. <laughs> so if food is medicine, why doesn't the insurance company pay for food when it is medicine? The problem is only real food is medicine. Processed food is poison. So you don't want the food industry paying for the poison, you want them to be paying for the medicine. And it turns out that the medicine, i.e. real food, is one-tenth of the cost of the drugs that are used to treat the diseases that the processed food causes. So it is actually in the food industry, sorry, in the insurance industry's best interest to help pay for real food. The question is, how do you do that? Well, as it turns out, and I'm not here to plug anything, but I am the chief medical officer of a startup out of Nebraska called Fugal, F-O-O-G-A-L, which is food plus frugal put together. And what it does is it ties four stakeholders together, the patient, the doctor, the grocery store, and the insurance company. And the idea is that if you're a subscriber to this, you can get your food, real food, covered by your insurance company, delivered from your grocery store with the recipe for the uh, dish you want to make, say chicken cacciatore, and, it will, and the uh, uh, platform will actually pick the food for you that will match your biochemical profile exactly so that you can actually get better eating real food. If you want to eat stuff that's not in that recipe, you know, order, order you know, the ice cream, uh, you get to pay for that yourself. And the point is that the digital platform can actually keep track of what is real food and what is your personal choice. And that way the insurance company wins, the patient wins, the doctor wins, and guess what? The grocery store even wins because they end up selling the current loss leaders. They sell the stuff around the edges. 
And it, it, we expect some kind of evolution here. It's clear I was with the CEO of a major health insurance company and they basically said, all right, we're gonna be put out of business either because our costs are gonna raise too high or and people will come in and socialize it or, or we're just gonna fail. And it really comes around this food issue. So I think the, the most logical it, approach is what Dr. Lustig just said. The thing we're interested in is whether there's any other kind of entrepreneurial approach to make this easier as we see Amazon's getting close to the customer, retail's getting closer to the customer. We're starting to see new technology that helps people figure out what's best for them. We're developing new ingredients that are at a lower cost. And there's some combination of innovation that's gonna get there. But the practical reality is to get to the next horizon on healthcare, we have got to solve the food problem. And it's immediately in healthcare companies' interest to do this, the insurers, but it is a little bit peculiar in terms of they, even in talking to them, they're like, well, maybe if, when somebody gets their metformin, I'll cross coupon them to Impossible Burger. So their, their thinking is, is over in that lane as opposed to let's develop a new, a new approach. I think if you get a chance, if you read the ex Aetna CEO's uh, book on leadership. He wrote in the back a lot about why they merged Aetna and CVS. And the notion there was that you would walk into a CVS and there would be the equivalent of the I Apple genius counter in the back. And you would walk in and, and say, I'm, I'm 65 years old. I wanna play with my grandchildren. I'm having a hard time. Uh, because I've got diabetes and that there would be somebody who would say, well, you should think about these exercises, these food, this is how you can get access to it. This is how you can kick it, cook it. It's sort of a combination of those solutions. And I, I don't know that the CVS approach is going to work. That's still, and it's not launched yet, but uh, I think that it's from an innovation standpoint, I uh, we're at a point where the, it's going to be a lot more obvious in a couple of years we're gonna go through an iPhone-like revolution where we, we, the basic paradigm will be what Dr. Lustig just said, but some, some smart entrepreneurs gonna step in and sort of say, here's some other ways to simplify that and, and make it broader. And, and I honestly think it's gonna happen in the next five years uh, because of the pressures are so dramatic on the system. Yeah. Taking a, a little bit of a step back towards the, the health side, we have a question from Joseph. Pergolizzi. Joseph, do you want to ask your question? Are you there, Joseph? I, I know Joseph, so hopefully we can get him on the air, and it's Dr. Joseph um, Pergolizzi, so he's, he's usually a pretty dynamic questioner, so you need to unmute him, maybe. All well, right. Yeah, there Thank you so much, Carter. Uh, yeah, great, great synopsis and, and always interesting. Um, so one of the uh, disciplines I'm a specialist in is in pain medicine. And I always get questions from my patients about sugar and or artificial sweeteners and chronic pain. So I thought maybe you could uh, maybe provide a little insight into you know, how you see that might have uh, some type of contributory aspect to it. Well, uh, there, there's no absolute here. There's no you know, one-to-one -one correlation. I can tell you that a lot of patients of mine, kids, you know, I was, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist, would come to clinic, obese kids, and we would, you know, and they would have numerous uh, uh, complaints and symptoms of various sorts, and pain was one of them. And when we got them on real food, a lot of those symptoms would often go away. Um, autoimmune disease would get better, and there's reason why. I'm actually writing a book about this right now as to what happens in the gut in terms of changes in the microbiome and changes in this phenomenon called leaky gut that leads to inflammatory cytokines going from the intestine into your bloodstream. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt that changing the food changes your microbiome within 48 hours. So if a chronic pain syndrome is being driven by inflammatory cytokines, there is a very good chance that you could make a difference in, by sugar reduction and by eating real food. Now, 
on any given patient, I couldn't prove that. But there is certainly a fair amount of data that supports the notion that by improving the microbiome, you reduce leaky gut and therefore you improve uh, 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 in, in, uh, inflammatory response. A paper just came out yesterday from my colleagues at UCSF um, in the journal Cell that looks at the ketogenic diet and how beta hydroxybutyrate alters uh, uh, intestinal microbiome uh, uh, bifidobacteria and also the Th17 cell, which is an inflammatory cell within the intestine. So that might be the, the reason, but I can't tell you that for any given patient. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Sally Aldrich. So she wants to know, how do you address consumer demand with the U.S. addiction to sugar and sugar being found extensively in fast food? Getting the average American to choose to eat better is a huge challenge. So I'm looking for your guys' thoughts on that. All right, I'm going to let you start with that one. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, my general attitude is price. I, I think that you need to make good food taste better and cost less. And so that's 60% of people ultimately make their decisions based on price and and whether there's a portion of that that I'd like to remove out of the subsidy just because I'm not a big fan of subsidies because they disrupt it. But uh, we're very focused on trying to figure out how to make fresh food. Right now, the fresh food chain has about a 40% waste stream. So right there without changing lettuce per se, if we can cut down the waste in that stream. And then we're looking at, at various new technologies that would boost up the taste. Can you make it so that something like uh, kale is fresher? And if you've ever had like a really fresh tomato, it really is addictive in and of itself. Now, the part of that's actually a forms of sugar in it, but, but if we can make it so that, that most tomatoes, for example, have been bred to be stable for two or three weeks, if we can shorten that supply chain and make it so you get a fresh tomato and it has that incredible taste, then people will start to shift in that direction. But it, it really, I think, ultimately comes, there's so much, you can put so much pressure on people to change, but... Ultimately, they got to go to the store, and they have a certain amount of money, and they can afford a certain amount, and they're going to buy what's they're going to buy what's cheap. So I'm going to uh, give you two separate uh, answers to this question. One is at the human level, and one's at the uh, the governmental level. At the human level, we have done focus groups on people to ask what it is that makes it so hard to eat real food, and the answer is when people go into the grocery store, they are paralyzed. They don't know how to read a label. They don't, they, they actually get lost in the morass of information, advertising, direct, you know, marketing, end caps. The bottom line is by the time they end up in the store, they are completely confused and end up buying the absolute worst thing possible in part because they got confused. The supermarket is a dangerous place. Fixing that is going to be a you know, long-term uh, effort. And it's, it starts with the label, but there's gotta be easier ways. You know, there's the traffic light system on, in Europe that seems to be uh, somewhat beneficial. There's the Nova system out of Brazil that looks at the degree of food processing that will you know, take us a very long way in terms of this. Um, so there are things that can be done. The second has to do with government. So in 2006, the British government, facing an epidemic of stroke and, uh, and uh, hypertension, called all of the food retailers, Tesco, Sainsbury, et cetera, uh, Marks and Spencer, together in the UK. And the, the Blair government basically said, you are going to all work together and we're going to be the referee, and you are going to reduce the amount of sodium within your processed foods by 10% each year over a three-year period. And everyone's going to play, and we're not going to tell the public. And everyone played, and the, and the government played referee, and the bottom line is that they were able to accomplish a 30% reduction in sodium consumption across the board in the UK. And two years after that, a paper was published in BMJ showing a 40% reduction in hypertension and stroke. So here was a public health uh, uh, 
uh, intervention driven by government to affect public health and no one even noticed. So that is what can be done when you do it right. Could we do that here in America? Well, we could, but that would mean you need a government that works and we have one that doesn't. So building on this, I think that the, as you start thinking about Fitbit, as you start thinking about the personalization that's starting to come out of places like Amazon and Trader Joe's and Walmart, that there are, there are ways to build on this so that people are better informed. And, and we sort of have two, as we think about it, we think of sort of two levels to this. There's the, the call it accessible level. I have a phone, I have access to doctors, I have access to information. There's that sort of level. And then there's another level, which is sort of the food deserts don't have access to this information. Uh, I'm intrigued about how to solve both. Uh, I, I certainly more information at the front end to educate people in the way Dr. Lustig is talking about. There's a, we can collaboratively drive to this and just make a decision to move forward without getting ourselves boxed down in regulation. Nobody wants to kill their own, their, their own customers. And there's a certain amount of, I don't know if you call it intimidation, but sort of guys, let's get our act together here and move forward. But then on the global basis, uh, we expect that the amount of people moving to the middle class is going to dramatically increase through globalization and global growth, and that there's a huge demand for food on a, on a global basis. So we not only have to sort of conquer it between the haves and have-nots within the United States, but we also have to look at what's going to happen on a global basis. And that still gets back to if you've got that kind of scale, there's opportunity both at the front end in terms of retail, better positioning, and then there's also opportunity for investment on the back end in terms of improving ingredients, improving supply chains. So a, it's a ripe opportunity for lots of different things and lots of ideas. And because we're dealing this on a global basis, there are a lot of different markets that are going to be able to approach it in different ways. Absolutely. Well, speaking of consumer choices and consumer habits, we have a question from Melanie Burns. Melanie, are you there? I'm here. My question is, with what we know today about COVID, is there anything individuals can do right now to improve their health, maintain their immune systems, and overall improve their ability to withstand the COVID-19? Funny you should ask, ask that, because we were just talking about that before the uh, uh, webinar started. So let me, let me take that. Who dies from COVID? Well, the elderly, they have defective immune systems for all sorts of reasons. And three other demographics, blacks and Latinos, the obese and diabetics. So let's take those, those groups and those are all under 60. Blacks and Latinos, obese and diabetics. What do they all share in common? processed food. That's, you know, uh, blacks and Latinos consume twice the amount of processed food as, you know, lower, uh, as higher socioeconomic groups. Uh, obese, diabetics. And there's a reason they, if you actually look at the biology of the COVID virus, uh, it uses a portal to enter cells called ACE2, which is angiotensin converting enzyme two, happens to be a receptor for a hormone that I take care of as an endocrinologist. I've known about this for a long time and it's on every cell. It's particularly on lung cells and on blood vessels, which is why COVID ends up being a lung and blood vessel disease. Of course, blood vessels are everywhere. So that's why you now have neurologic syndromes and other inflammatory syndromes as well. The point is insulin resistance, which is associated with being black and Latino, being obese and being diabetic, increases the number of ACE2 receptors on cells, thereby increasing the number of portals that the virus can use to infect, thereby driving a greater reaction. So that's one reason. Second reason, there is a, a, a breakdown product of fiber called butyrate. It's a short chain fatty acid, and it is in, uh, immunosuppressive. It is anti-inflammatory. Well, you need to consume fiber in order to be able to make butyrate, or you have to eat a ketogenic diet like this paper that just came out in Cell. 
Bottom line, if you're not making butyrate, you're not suppressing your immune system. And so that also increases your response to COVID, uh, or at least it re increased your response to SARS. We assume it's the same for COVID. We haven't actually seen those data yet. And then the third is that diabetes, because of the high blood glucose, turns out it causes uh, an opening of, the, uh, of that uh, uh, ACE2, and it also coats the virus particle itself and makes it harder for it to be cleared. So high blood glucose seems to affect it, uh, uh, its infectivity and its uh, ability to cause morbidity and mortality. Now, the question is, so we have a plausibility argument for why you should improve your metabolic health so you don't die of this disease. It won't stop you from getting infected, but it certainly uh, could help you not die from it. We don't have the empiric data to show that, but it is a good plausibility argument. And geez, it will help every other aspect of your metabolic health. You know, this is, this to be, is a no brainer, but you know, you know, they you know, the food industry is going to sell anyway. Thanks for that answer, Dr. Lustig. Uh, we're going to shift to Scott Barnett. Scott, are you there? I am indeed here. Uh, thank you. Um, and I have to just to spring from Dr. Lustig's last answer, Dr. Lustig, I've, I've read your books. I'm uh, actually a member of the black community and formerly, you know, it was quite overweight myself. And so I appreciate your response there related oh. to COVID-19. By um, the way, new, new book coming. <laughs> I intend to uh, intend to read it, but um, so your work it's on called sugar called Food, me. Pharma, Feds, Fiasco. Perfect. Looking forward to it. Well, so I, I like the idea, the basic idea of eat real food. I mean, this this sounds that this would be great as a practical matter. Having the time to buy and prepare fresh food while working full time is difficult. Yes. Is there a role for quick serve places? I, many of them are shut down right now, I know, but restaurants and quick serve places and such here. And I'm interested in a response both from a, a nutritional perspective, health perspective, and also from the entrepreneurial perspective. Thanks. So the answer is there could be. It depends on the, on the specific quick, uh, quick food place. Uh, if they're cook, using real food, then, you know, by all means, a lot of them are not because it's a matter of, you know, cash flow and money and, you know, and keeping stuff uh, long periods of time on, on a shelf. Let me give you an example. Bread. If you buy a loaf of bread at your local bakery, how soon before it stales? Two days, three days? If you buy a loaf of bread at the supermarket, how soon before it stales? Uh, much three weeks. Longer. Yeah. How come? They're both bread. Sugar, preservatives. You bet. They add, so the grocery bread has sugar added to it because the sugar doesn't boil off in the oven. It's called water activity. And sugar is hygroscopic. It holds on to water, thereby keeping the bread moister for longer so they can have a longer sell-by date. So decreases depreciation, increases profit, but you know, you're dead. What do you care? So, you know, if if a quick serve uh, uh, establishment is making sandwiches and they're making it using grocery store bread, you know, you're already behind the eight ball. So it depends on what you're doing. It depends on what's being used. Could they be valuable? Absolutely. The real problem is, as you said, cooking real food takes time. And I totally get that. And people don't have time, but there's something even worse because they now don't know how to cook. One third of Americans today don't know how to cook. And the reason is because they abdicated over the years from 1980 until 2019, the need to be able to cook because the food industry said, oh, we'll cook for you. And so now no one knows how to cook. The fact of the matter is, if you know how to cook, you can actually make a meal pretty darn fast. And I do it every day. In fact, we published a real food cookbook. It's called the Fat Chance Cookbook published it in 2014. Every single recipe in the book is, was vetted by a Mount Diablo high school student to be producible, consumable, and delicious in 30 minutes or less. Anyone can do it. The most complicated piece of equipment you need is a blender. And 
Because of COVID-19, my nonprofit, Eat Real, eatreal.org, put the entire contents of the book up on the website so that everyone has access to it for free. So there's no excuse. So the, uh, the building on this a bit, we, when I look at ultra processed, I see two things. One, there's a certain incentive to produce it uh, and there's a certain affordability to produce it. But then on the other side, there's a convenience to it. And so we've been looking hard across the board at convenience. One of my frustrations with some of the people who are investing in the food industry is they focus on sort of the high end preference. Uh, they've been, you know, serve great food to people that can afford it. And we've been thinking a lot about the ultra process. So here, an example would be something like impossible. So impossible meats in its first instance, it's unclear that, well, uh, the long list of reasons why it is and a long list of reasons why it isn't better than meat. But then the question is, is it better than ramen noodles? And there's a certain part of the population whose diet is dramatically ramen noodles that perhaps is the wrong thing to eat and a more affordable inversion of impossible burger may not be the perfect answer, but maybe a, maybe an intermediate answer. And so then we think hard about things like ingredients is can we, can we reduce the cost of those ingredients and take it so something like version two or three or four of an impossible burger is price competitive against ramen noodles. And for the people that still need to have that convenience and can't figure out the cooking side, uh, should we still make sure that that option is available? So we, my attitude as an investor and my attitude as sort of an entrepreneur is pluralist. It's sort of all the above. You know, if we can figure out how to serve fresh food to everybody, that's also on our agenda. Uh, I don't know the answer myself right now, but we certainly are investing across the board on, on all of the elements. Uh, we, the other macro dynamic that's going on is people are with things like the sharing economy, people don't buy cars, that's $2,000 or so, $2,000, $3,000 a year more of money that people have once you figure all the factors in for a car, sometimes it's more and they're starting to move that spend over to more fresher food. And then we're seeing uh, some organization where the, the retailers are moving more and more towards being able to provide more meals ready to eat. So I, I, I don't have the answer per se. Uh, there's a lot in works on the, on the innovation side. I think that all cases, fresh food properly cooked at home is the gold standard of, of proper care. But, but you know, we're gonna figure out in the marketplace how to serve some of the intermediate so I'm going to go ahead and ask Tanya Weathersby if she is ready to ask her question. Yes, I am. Um, okay. Yes, um, I'm a journalist, and uh, one of the things that I, that, that I know of, just um, not just in my journalism career and writing about these kinds of things, but also living in an urban community in Jacksonville, is that, um, well, everywhere, sugar is used as, as, a, as something to comfort people, is used as something to reward people. And when you have situations, the, the population we're talking about, people who are struggling, who are poor, mostly minority, a lot of people who don't have other means of recreation and other ways to reward themselves and their kids, sometimes what they do is they go out and they buy a lot of sugary snacks. They buy a lot of things like that. It was a lady I mentored one time took a lot of a check and bought like three gallons of ice cream and all kinds of sweets for our kids because they couldn't go anywhere else. So my question is, what can we begin to do to start to, start to um, reduce, uh, um, 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 uh, um, neutralize these cultural metaphors and these cultural things that, um, that basically, you know, um, tout sugar as a reward? What, what, can, what can we begin to do, especially when we have populations that you know, see it, that, that use it that way because they this restricted and don't have the means to do other things. Boy, oh boy, that is the $64 zillion question, <laughs> Tanya, and thank you. Um, and I, boy, if I had an answer to that, you know, uh, uh, no, Nobel Prize, I think. Um, <laughs> let me tell you a quick story. In 2000, I lived in Memphis, Tennessee. That's where I am. And we noticed uh, the Memphis Area Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, MASPIN, noticed that all the grocery stores had been basically, had left the uh, uh, poor neighborhood called Orange Mound. Oh, and, yeah. we, and we went to the uh, Board of Aldermen, all 17 of them, 
him up on that dais at Memphis City Hall and basically argued that this was a problem, that there were lots of Popeye's fried chickens and there were no grocery stores and that we needed to do something about this, you know, th th this shift in how food was uh, procured and marketed within, you know, neighborhoods like Orange Mound. And one of the aldermen, black guy, looked down his nose and his glasses at us from the dais and said, you want to take away the single thing in these people's lives that give them pleasure? Yeah. And you know, I didn't have an answer for that then. But I sort of have an answer for it now. Okay. And I guess the question is, what kind of pleasure you want? And for how long? And pleasure is not the same thing as happiness. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are seven differences between pleasure and happiness. What do you really want? You really want pleasure or you really want happiness? Everyone says they want to be happy. So here are the seven differences. Pleasure is short-lived, like an hour, like a meal. Happiness is long-lived, like a lifetime. Pleasure is visceral. You feel it in your body. Happiness is eth ethereal. You feel it above the neck. Pleasure is taking. Happiness is giving. Pleasure is experienced alone. Happiness is usually experienced in social groups. Pleasure can be achieved with substances, like cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol, sugar. Happiness cannot be achieved with substances. The extremes of pleasure, whether it be substances or behaviors, all in the extreme lead to addiction. There's an aholic after every one of those, alcoholic, chocoholic, shopaholic, sexaholic. But there's no such thing as overdosing on too much happiness. And finally, pleasure is dopamine and happiness is serotonin. Two different neurotransmitters, two different areas of the brain, two different sets of receptors, two different mechanisms of actions, two different regulatory systems. They are not the same. So which do you want, Tanya? You want pleasure or you want happiness? I'm all, I'm all in for happiness. Well, yeah. get with the friggin' program, people. <laughs> well, so building on this. To help them move that along. And I wrote a book about it. It's called The Hacking of the American Mind. Okay. So uh, building on this a bit, uh, we always think about what a how do customers react. And there are people who have changed their diet. And when you ask why they've changed their diet, you start to get some really interesting questions. And I think exposing that more, it's a sense of a mentorship model, but exposing that more helps people start to find their own journey. But very specifically, when I talk to anybody who says, you know, I changed my diet, I lost X amount of pounds, I say, what influenced you most? Was it a book you read, some doctor you told it, or your kids? And I would say 99% of the time, they say my young adult children changed my behavior in some particular way to a different direction. So that, that set of education is, is, has shown up as an important influence. The thing I would love to do with you specifically, I think you and I have talked about this briefly, or maybe I had this conversation with Lyman. Yeah, yeah, we did. When we're, when we're talking about what we're trying to do with Cressonia, Cressonia is the concept of, uh, if you're, if you're Ro John Robinson Crusoe tossed on an island, you can sit there and wallow in your situation and try to catch fish, or you can build a boat, you can build a net, you can increase the amount of fish you get and, and increase your survival. So there, there's a certain amount of entrepreneurship involved in, in every advancement that we take. I would really be intrigued because I don't know the answer exactly here, but, but I, one thing I wanted to do specifically when we think about what we're trying to do with Crisonia and Memphis is really take all these ideas and use Memphis as a proving ground for the new food system. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be interesting to write a cookbook when we were down there last year, there were some great chefs that came in and, and cooked uh, some really unique food. And I think it would be interesting to write a cookbook tuned for Memphis, which takes the best of what United Health Care is trying to do down there at, at church, what's it called? Church Street? Church Health Center. Church Health Center. Yeah. Take that and then take, you know, Dr. Lustig did some, his fellowship down at, at down there for a little bit is that right or you were in memphis in memphis what were you in I, was, I was i was an associate professor at st jude and at levana okay so he's got some perspective okay. but I, I would be interested in seeing some personal interest stories about people who've changed their diet 
-hmm. And it would be interesting and fun maybe to assemble for our event, you know, once we wander back in May, maybe a cookbook that takes the practical challenges and really puts it in a context of, of this community, what diet, what, what food both sort of still tastes good, still makes you happy and still makes Dr. Lustig happy. <laughs> in terms of, I think that would be a fun project to work on. So. Yeah, I think so too. And also, you know, I've also, I don't know if Lyman told you this, but I've also traveled extensively to Cuba and they're doing a lot of things with food sustainability, but you can also look at even these countries that struggle with all the issues we know they struggle with, you know, you look at the fact that a lot of them, you know, they still have a, um, they have fewer health problems that we, than we have, and they have a, a lower mortality rate. But one of the things I noticed when I was there is that whenever they got something sweet to eat, it was like a reward, like, like the ice cream part. That's the only place they went through. They went there as a reward. And I often thought about, you know, people would take their kids there maybe once a week, if that much, as a reward. And then I think about kids who go every day at, to the 7-Eleven, you know, to get <laughs> chips and junk here. You know, big difference right there. Let me, let me make it clear oh. to you, Tanya. I am for dessert. Oh, me too. <laughs> for dessert. All I'm right. up for dessert for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a, a great place for me to break in here. This is certainly not the end of the conversation. This conversation is ongoing in so many different ways around Crusonia conversations and Crusonia on the Delta. But before I tell you a little bit more about how we can keep this conversation that's really heating up in the chat right now, uh, keep that conversation going, I want to take a moment to thank Dr. Lustig, Carter Williams. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. This was an incredible conversation. There were so many more questions we wanted to get to. Uh, but we also want to say a big thank you to our sponsors, or our partners, forgive me, uh, Benson Hill, a partner of the Community Foundation of Greater Memphis, Cushman and Wakefield Commercial Advisors, EY, and United Health Group. Uh, I also wanted to mention that Crusonia Conversations are free to attend, but unfortunately not free to produce. So please consider donating to the Crusonia Fund. Go to crusoniaonthedelta.org to donate or click on the donation link in your follow-up email. And please join us next month for Crusonia Conversations with Matt Chris, CEO of Benson Hill, and Leslie Bonchi. Uh, that'll be on June 24th. You can register at crusoniaonthedelta.org. Uh, if you're looking to revisit today's conversation or to keep up with Crusonia Conversations that like I said, are happening in the chat right now and happening uh, kind of across the internet and at all times. Uh, please follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and our very, very lively Slack channel. Uh, we also invite you to tell us what you liked and what you thought could be improved about this presentation in our follow-up survey. List, uh, links for all of those resources will be in a follow-up email that you'll receive after this event. So thanks so much again for joining us and we look forward to seeing everyone again on June 24th.